Oh, live. We is just it, went live. Is this mic working? Yes. <laughs> okay. All right, we are trying something new here. We're trying to go live. So two seconds to let me get this spun up. Is that, is that Mike? Yeah. Hey, what's up, man? How you doing? I, I can't see anything. I'm waiting for uh, our girl, to uh, Mariah, to kind of help me get oriented. There we go. There we go. Now, who am I talking to? Hey, that's a good question, man. It, it's complete chaos. Yeah. Yeah, this isn't, this isn't, this isn't my, my bag, man. We're going to try it, dude. Yeah, dude, I like, I, that, I like that scenery behind me. Holy shit, that's beautiful, man. Hey, you're actually mid-move right now. Uh, you want to start talking, dude? Let's uh, let's get into it. Yeah, for sure, man. For sure. So, at, as people know, we uh, we did a, a, a rifle for a Task Force 69, man. Mike, you want to talk about this thing at all a little bit? Yeah, sure. So, um, we had some pretty cool things come out. Holy shit, those numbers are going up. So, um, I think the biggest thing I want you to speak to for a second, Mike, is handguard. Because a lot of people were confused about the handguard, thinking it was the same thing that's been done before. But it's a whole new handguard system that uh, we have on this particular rifle. Yeah, so this is this is our M89 drive lock rail. It is completely in the... I, I've noticed there is some confusion, and I see this on the internet sometimes, and it's kind of funny. I, I would... Um, <laughs> The drive lock rail is completely new. No one's ever done this before. Now we never use, been done before. Yeah, well, no, but we we so it's, I mean it's, we use. Well, if people understand what that means, it's a piece of raw finished aluminum for the handguard. Like that was the extrusion we used. And I wanted it to be a little bit wider than our normal wedge lock M76 rails because number one, I think there's this kind of they heat up pretty fast. And then there's also limited real estate around that gas block if you want to start mounting anything from bipods to lights or whatever. You're limited to a little bit of real estate specifically around the gas block. So using a wider extrusion. That was Jim Hodge's contribution to the drive lock was that we used an S-lock extrusion. Now the lockup self itself, the drive lock, that barrel nut and like that wedge design was actually designed by uh, guys over at Killer Innovations and uh, and as you know, Mike Miller, you know Mike over at Killer. He was the I founder. Uh, yeah, he was the founder and the brains behind Mega Mega Machine, which what, a, what an awesome fucking brand that that you know was. And that was one of the one of my inspirations when I first started Sons. So Mike kind of came up with the actual barrel nut in the way that that rail locks with those three independent wedges, and then Jim's extrusion the width of that material was the Hodge uh, contribution. So I hope that clears up the, <laughs> I hope that clears up some of the uh, confusion uh, on the origins of this thing. It's an, it's an ultra st strong rail, which is what we are looking for as far as a rifle that we wanted to do with Sons of Liberty. Uh, I mean, beyond that, of course, the Surefire three prong, because uh, I, I have a horrible love affair with Surefire despite uh, the times I've been slighted by them, but I just love the Surefire three-prong as like a general purpose muzzle device. But more importantly, I love the uh, Surefire suppressor. I use that on like every single gun that I have. Yeah, sure. I mean, Surefire is, like, you know, Surefire is one of those super proven brands. Uh, I mean, I'm a big Surefire fan myself. Like that muzzle device, I got to tell you, and, and Mike, you can tell people this, uh, it was that damn muzzle device that held this project. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. The uh, there's a lot of a lot of people are asking me why five versus thirteen nine or thirteen seven or whatever. Um, so we can argue like barrel lengths all because obviously if we go like with a thirteen seven or a thirteen nine, I mean very famously, Mike, we did that uh, that rifle with you guys way back when, where you're getting at like the edge for what the ATF considers legal and fuck the ATF by the way but so what yes. we're looking at yes. here with 14.5 is you do get very gassing and really good I like the 5 or the 16 depending on your kind of um, environment that you're going into so a lot of the shooting that we've been doing recently on our side is that um, we found that the 14.5 to 16 is really giving in terms of your bullet drop 
So when you when you get your optic dialed in, uh, the more velocity you have, the less uh, you have on your side. So we've been really liking that barrel length. Why we went with the fourteen five? Obviously, you don't lose too much when you go to thirteen seven, but at the same time, you don't lose that much from there going to twelve five. Everything's gradual, so we want to stick with the uh, fourteen five as far as yeah. good and good yeah. velocity without giving you too much length. Because as we know, it can be too big. <laughs> it's, too, it's too big. It's too big. So, uh, well, I like that you're talking about it from a shooter's perspective. I'll talk about it a little bit from like a rifle maker's perspective and the importance of dwell time. So you have that mid gas system, okay, which is getting closer to the original engineering of the gun, right? That longer gas system. And then you have an extra inch of dwell time. Uh, over the 13.7. Now, 13.7 rifles, they shoot super nice. They're super reliable. But if you were to look at things, like if you were to look at, if you were to push something to its furthest extreme edge of the performance envelope, like if you were to shoot a gun just until it died, if you were to develop, put it in a fixture of some kind and pull the trigger just until the gun died thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of rounds, believe it or not, the 14.5 would probably go just a little bit longer in terms of function simply due to the dwell time. That extra inch of dwell is going to force the fucking gun to go. Now, granted, that's not your day-to-day -day every, you know, that's, that's not your normal deployment or engagement type of situation, but an extra inch of dwell is never a bad thing. Hey, it matters, Mike. <laughs> extra inch, that's what she said, yeah. <laughs> the, uh, no, I think more importantly beyond that, so we, do you want to talk to the buffer system? Because this is something we talked about quite at length, man, but you are, are so insanely knowledgeable at this. I want you to be able to speak to this a little bit because you blow my mind every time I talk to you about like uh, buffers and, and, and the complete system as far as the gassing is concerned. Yeah. So like the mid gas system is getting us closer to the original engineering, that longer gas tube, uh, you know, of the, of the, of the way that rifle is designed. Well, the, the, the A5 system is doing the same thing on the back end of the gun. Like the gun's a fucking algebra equation, right? So whatever you're doing on one side, you do to the other. The A5 system, it's a Veltor A5 system that we've used from day one, right? This is how we spec rifles from eight years ago, day one. It uses a rifle link spring. A, the buffer itself holds an extra weight. Like a mil spec buffer holds three weights. This one holds four. We're able to push more mass without over buffering because we're distributing it over more wire. And whenever you do that, whenever you use that rifle buffer or that, sorry, that rifle spring with that A5 buffer, you're making the gun very fucking forgiving. It's much less sensitive to input. And by input, I mean suppressors, ammo variation, uh, the gun being foul, the gun being dry, you know. To me, that's a horrible idea. I want auto tune. I want like you know, like nothing is static on this gun. The the conditions in which the guns are being used is it is it five degrees outside? Is it one hundred and five degrees outside? What ammo are you feeding the weapon? It has all the lube burned off the fucking gun because you've subjected it to a very high firing schedule. Is it suppressed? On and on and on and on. And so whenever you try to tune a rifle for a certain condition, what you're doing is you're you're limiting it. You're, you're shrinking its operational envelope. The A5 system is built to widen the fucking operational envelope as wide as it can possibly go. That's why we use it on a fighting gun, because it don't give a fuck. Whatever you throw at it, it's going to keep feeding. The, so, I mean, that was kind of like the whole point behind the rifles. We had a... So, from a shooter's perspective, I wanted... Obviously, something with, like, extremely strong lockup. But beyond that, we wanted to make sure the system was gas, not just at the bleeding edge of reliability, which I think a lot of people are doing, but we wanted something that was um, what I would call combat gas, uh, right? Something that's going to work in a, a variety of different situations, temperatures and configurations with suppressors, et cetera. Yeah, yes. So this is another, and this is another thing that really frustrates me about reading uh, the internet, okay? And I'm glad you asked the question. I'm glad we have an audience to address this, right? So you, you need a little bit more gas. So I think you'd be surprised about how little gas you need to actually run the gun. But run the gun in an optimal condition. You need a little bit more gas than that to drive the gun through adversity. So you want, you want adequate gas and ample mass. That's how the equation works, right? You need a, there's, 
This rifle has a, a hair bit more gas than you probably actually fucking need, but that's how you drive it through when the weapon is dry, when the weapon is foul, when the gas rings are worn. You know, whenever it's negative five degrees, negative 10 degrees outside, you know, you're, everything works different. Every condition is changing. And if the goal is to have the most reliable rifle you can, then there is a happy medium between gas and mass, right? You don't want the gun so over gas that when you put a suppressor on there, you've pushed it outside of its operational envelope. That'd be stupid. But you don't want so little gas that the first time you introduce any kind of fucking adversity to the system, the goddamn thing dies. And I see this argument on the internet where people are putting comfort over reliability, okay? This fucking thing is built to run. It's built to run suppress or unsuppress in any condition you fucking put it in. And that's why we do it like this. And I wish people would quit fucking with our formula. <laughs> I love Mike going on his, on his tangents about uh, gassing on, on weapons. This motherfucker spitting over here. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, so we have uh, Simon over from Brownells. Uh, he has a rifle with him right there. Uh, so obviously we're gonna we're gonna show it off a little bit. So we talked about the handguard quite a bit. Um, the big thing was that you want good uh, airflow around the barrel. You also want the rail to act as a heat sink. Uh, have enough material, not so little that you're easily deflecting the rail when you're impacting with objects. Because in a real um, in a real whether whatever you may be doing, larping or or what have you, you're gonna be impacting that rail on things. I mean. If you've just gone hiking with the gun, that gun is 100% going to hit a rock. So you don't want something that's going to be easily deflected. And so you want enough material. You're going to have to sacrifice a little bit of weight up front to ensure that you have a tough rifle. You don't want one that's going to go, um, like, think about the the first magnesium KMR rails that would bend like you just hit them and they just immediately dent in. You don't want that. So that's what we have with that one. You can see there's really good airflow towards the back. Towards the front is where we have all the M-lock. You're typically not going to mount anything at the – you know, the odd positions further back on the rail, which is why it was designed that way. And if we go all the way back to like the butt sock, uh, this, excuse me, if we go all the way back to the butt sock, we're looking uh, at the Volter A5 and we're also looking at the BCM. A lot of people ask me why the BCM stock. Do you want to show that, Simon? Um, the reason is I like a very slim stock. I don't need that shit getting caught up on my gear, my equipment. Um, I do like the B5s. I like the big cheek weld that you get. But at the same time, I found that for me personally, when shooting, I want something that's thinner and doesn't get in my, in my way as much, especially when we're getting down to odd position and shooting around cover and barricades. So again, this is my rifle. This is what I like. So that's what's so funny about it is like, uh, if you really don't like the stock, go sell it. I'll buy it from you. But this is a setup I use, and this is what I like the most. Like 14.5, good b stock and especially when we talk about the grip on this guy uh, that nice shallow angle to ensure that uh, your wrists aren't getting messed up especially long time shooting and you know getting behind the gun you want that more shallow angle to kind of help you um just don't have to cant your wrist at a weird angle and that puts your elbow at a weird angle and then you start developing spinal problems and then you're mike tyson before you know it just it's a it's quick you know it's super quick. Dude, this chat is out of control. If you haven't been looking at it, <laughs> it is going, dude. Uh, if you guys don't know, you can get the uh, Signature Edition Grand Thumb uh, rifle over from Brownells, um, and that's a big thing. And then um, people are asking, so do you want to talk uh, to the barrel a little bit? Yeah. So, again, this is <laughs> what's funny is I uh, is reading reading the comments on some of this stuff. The – so with, with Sons Liberty, I mean, you you know this, Mike, with Sons Liberty, we, if somebody were to shoot out a Sons Liberty barrel, I, I replace it for free, no questions asked. And I do that because I got tired of listening to fucking debates and arguments online about, uh, you know, barrels and, and techniques and stuff. But I can tell you this, that from our own data, the material that a barrel is made of is probably more important than the, the process in which it's made, right? Like if you were to look at 416 stainless or 410 stainless, that material is going to typically have a shorter barrel life than your mil dash B dash eleven five ninety echo or whatever the military ordnance grade steel is for a barrel. Now, once you've achieved the right material, the process in which it's made becomes a little bit less, I think, important in the overall way that you know a barrel is constructed. Gas ports, chambers, uh, true journals; those things become a lot more important, I think, in terms of function. Just real quick on barrel life too. Something that's interesting, you know. Uh, Longer barrels typically uh, last longer than shorter barrels. Um, that, are you suppressing it? Uh, that you know, well, all of those factors kind of go into making it very difficult to, to accurately pin down what that barrel life is. So, because it's kind of a spooky thing, 
what we did was just, hey, once the barrel opens up to a group size that you're dissatisfied with, I'll fucking replace it. <laughs> like, and this isn't like some meme that I made, you know, this is like, hey, I'm, I'm backing this up with my own money. So go shoot the barrel and, um, you know, if you shoot it out, I'll replace it and you can send you a fucking hat. We don't do it very often. Uh, yeah, and, that, and that's what we're talking to, too. So when we're talking like a rifle that I want you guys to be able to pick up and, and trust it, right? I'm, I'm talking about something that's both going to run um, in terms of barrel. You're going to have acceptable accuracy for a long period of time. Uh, I love 10.3. I love 11.5. I love 12.5. But like Mike was talking about, uh, you have that erosion from the throat uh, of the chamber going forward. So I, I've, what was the thing I heard? I think it's like a, a thousand rounds, give or take, for every inch of rifling once you start kind of shooting it out. So for those extra, when you're going from like an 11.5 to a 14.5, you really do have a lot more serviceability for a longer period of time just due to the fact that you have more rifling to chew through. Yeah, and, and, it's gonna, yeah, and it'll stabilize a wider range of projectiles longer. What's interesting is like, Believe you'll start seeing accuracy degradation on lighter, like you know your 55 grain. You'll start seeing that happen sooner than your heavier stuff, and the reason being is because there's less, there's less bullet for the fucking rifling to bite into, right? A 55 grain bullet is typically has less material than like say a 77, and so you're giving the rifling has less material to work with, but. I don't care who makes the barrel. The fucking elves in Narnia can make it. If you subject it to a heavy enough firing schedule, barrels are consumable items. It doesn't matter. Once you achieve the right material, your your differences in process are going to be fucking negligible. And at least you have us standing behind us saying, go shoot it, go break it, let's fix it, let's keep shooting, fuck you, shoot. Also, I want to point out at the same time that the reason why this is all worth it is because Mike hates the ATF as well. So that makes it worth it. <laughs> um, so some people let me, let me, what let me just get in real quick and say, Mr. Yeah. Mitsubishi, Mr. Mitsubishi, you would make Eugene Stoner proud. <laughs> oh, <laughs> my hero! We have we have we have a mural to him where every every rifle that leaves the shop has to like stay under the you know, every cart that leaves is uh, blushed by Eugene on the way out. So that's the way it should be. Um, so for triggers, we do have a Geisley SSAE in there. Um, that is kind of my, uh, my go-to trigger. I use that every AR that I use. Um, if I'm able to get it in that gun, then I'm going to put it in there. So that's what we have in there. I think it's that, uh, combat triggers it is full power springs. Um, it is in every way, pretty much the Geisy super select fire, which is what is in use in SOCOM, uh, an awesome trigger all around. It's about a four and a half pound pull. Uh, first stage is like somewhere around two pounds and then like once you set into it especially when you're shooting long range and stuff you have like a two and a half pound let off i do prefer a two-stage trigger and it in rocks so much yeah so just let's, let's, just, go, ahead, let's go ahead and post that trigger there right we're asking for it yeah hey so just, just to just to kind of go over the four pillars of like a fighting gun right you want you want adequate gas you want ample mass. You want really powerful fucking extractors and ejectors, right? You want to make a hold. That's what we use our, you know, those spring code 512 XP extractor and ejector springs. Okay. And then on, then you use your heavier buffers, your powerful spring. Then your trigger, you want a fucking sledgehammer coming out on that firing pin to ensure primer detonation. That's why we like the Geisley with the heavy springs, because while that, that pull is very crisp, clean, predictable, it's got a good break, it's got a very positive reset. But you also have a fucking sledgehammer coming out on the firing pin to ensure primer detonation. That is how you build a reliable gun. If you stick to those those principles, those core principles, you have a gun that's real fucking hard to stop. And that's precisely what we're going for, guys. Um, I think there's a little confusion around this, but we wanted to put something together that was a good just fighting gun. Um, this is a gun that's going to run strong, very strong. It, it could it could easily bench 225 if I had to guess. And yeah. uh, it's a pleasure to shoot. So, like, with this gun, we're printing, uh, especially with, like, um, for old federal gold medal match, we're, we're stepping away on this guy. It is a very accurate rifle. It is a well-gassed yeah. weapon. Again, you're going to hit more gas than you do with a competition gun, but that's by design because we wanted this thing to push through all of the elements. It's a like quick guys. Yeah, and I think uh, <laughs> I think you and I had talked about uh, you and I are on the on the side. This is unrelated. But, like you and I are going to probably throw a little cash to some of our favorite advocacy uh, groups from this, right? 
Oh yeah, absolutely, man. Um, we're we're always doing good things for the community as much as we can. Um, I mean, that's the mission statement. The mission statement of the Grantham has, has always been to to help change the culture. And I know, Mike, you've been doing that on your side. And Brownells, you guys have been out of control doing the same thing. Like, we're all aiming for the same goals here. So if we can shoot for those goals, we'll also bring out a cool product, like, all the better. Hey, that's what I'm saying, man. It's a fun, it's a fun project. It's great to actually see some humor in the industry. There's, there's not enough humor, right? So the fact that we can do a Task Force uh, 69 uh, rifle. Mike, you, you and I have been friends for a long time. We're some of this money is going to a pretty good cause. And it's a good fucking rifle, dude. So I was, I'm, I've was, i had fun. It's been good. Um, before we go, Mike, uh, people do want to know about the the, um, the BCG, which is the heart of the gun. Yes. So, I mean, we're, we're a return to fundamentals kind of company, right? Like, if you're going to deviate from a formula that you know works, and I'm talking about sample sizes of millions and round counts of billions in every austere fucking condition the rifle's ever been fielded in, whether you're a Delta Force operator or a 17-year-old ASFAB waiver, if you look at the formula for how a bolt is constructed, like for real, like, a, like an actual military bolt, all right, you need a real compelling reason to deviate from that. And, you know, using a substitute material because it was cheaper that week, that's not it, right? So we stick to the actual formula. So you're talking about 58 inch pounds of torque on a grade A fastener. You know, you're, the way that you're using Permatex seal between the gas key and the, and the carrier, chrome line carriers, uh, you know, like we use a five coil XP extractor spring in there that uses the, the, the that black uh, extractor buffer 158 carpenter seal on the bolt individual individual hp mpi i know some people think that uh, hp testing is destructive yeah maybe i disagree with that but i tell you this though premature failure of a properly individually tested 158 bolt is highly fucking anomalous okay and we know that that thing is you, you're dealing in as close to certainty as close to mechanical certainty as we can get so yeah i mean Again, we kind of built a brand around a bolt carrier group because all we did was do it right. That's it. We didn't try to go uh, make shit new for the sake of marketability. We just wanted guns that fucking run. You know, my, if, there, if there's one thing I love doing, it's uh, mentioning one part of an AR and letting you talk for like 30 minutes. It's, <laughs> everything. it's to watch rant and rave about it. I love it so much. If you <laughs> So Mike knows entirely too much about rifles. When uh when I was down in Texas living out there for a little bit for uh military, um uh we used to just we'd get him going. And it, it was it was a good time. So if you guys don't know, we've we have a long history of Sons of Liberty. So to be able to continue to do work with them has always been a real pleasure. And uh we're real excited about this one. We have a lot of really cool content. I'm kinda giving you guys like the uh the 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 pre-show right here because once we release content on this guy they're gonna be gone then it's gonna take god knows how long to make more we'll, we'll be working on it but uh you can get them right now we have content coming on the next few weeks talking about uh their performance and stuff and uh yeah we're super excited about them and we're excited for uh you know this one's gonna be gone and then we are gonna have another run so uh hopefully that happens sooner so we can get them out but uh materials are crazy so get them when you can and we'll uh We'll, uh, we'll keep doing more stuff. And don't forget, these are also good for interdimensional. Uh, Can't hear him. That work, or are we running into uh, problems here? Yeah. Hey, listen, man. Mike, it's great to see you. Simon, I love you, brother. And uh, hey, next time. Next time. Hey, hey guys, what, 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 one, one other thing. Let me Let me tell you this. Limited availability, but if you hop on Brownells, you go to the Brownells deal page. There's a, uh, I believe there's a place to sign up to win a gun, right? So you can win one of these from Brownells right now. Hop on in, sign up, it's your opportunity to win one. But yeah, limited availability, find them at Suns, find them at Brownells Direct, get them while you can, guys. These will, these will go quick. Once people find out about them, they'll go quick. It's going to be very sad. We'll make it work. I'm glad to have hopped off to you guys, Simon. It's always good to see you. Let's rollerblade at the next uh, cry party. There you go. Hey, thanks, guys. It's good chatting with you both. Later, guys. Later, guys.